Um, it's now my great privilege to invite back to the lectern Sir Mason Dury, who's having a, a busy morning, and I really thank him for contributing to this discussion as well as the outstanding plenary we heard earlier. Um, for me, as a clinician practicing in New Zealand, it's almost inconceivable to practice without the underpinning of the Te Whare Tapawha model. Um, and to Sir Mason, we owe that expanded view um, for which I'm deeply grateful. He's a, a luminary in our healthcare system uh, and in our academic systems, and I'm sure you had a full introduction uh, at the beginning of his session, so I won't take too much more time, but to welcome him to the stage once again. Thank you, Sir Mason. Thank you for the introduction. I thought I'd start out by just giving you the conclusions. <laughs> Do it now rather than at the end, it'll save time. But the, the, there's really only uh, three points, three conclusions I want to make today on this subject. The first one is that Fano, that's families, Fano provide a logical starting point for the life course approach. That's the first conclusion. The second one is that Fano live in three experiential domains. The first domain is the world that they live in in their day-to-day -day lives, the relationships they have with each other, the energy, the strength, the determination that they bring as they interact, the, disparate, the uh, difficulties that they uh, undergo, that's their day-to-day -day reality, but the Fano group has a dynamic that's a critical part of Fano experience. Another part of their experience, another dimension to it, has to do not so much with what they experience today, but what the generations before them experienced. This is a historical dimension, and the historical dimension brings with it a certain amount of intergenerational trauma, possibly uh, contributed, expanded by the colonising experience that they've been through, the loss of land, and decades of disadvantage. That is all too often part of the Fano experience. And the third dimension that typifies Fano experience in modern times, the third experience is an experience shaped by the environment within which they currently live. And that environment is the built environment as much as it is the natural environment. And we've heard a lot about that already today. So they're the first two points. The second, the third point that I want to make really is that every intervention, whether it's a health intervention or an education intervention, any, every intervention provides an opportunity to strengthen Fano resolve to attain wellness and health, good health. So that's just the three, three points uh, I wanted to make, but I'll tell you how I come to, to make them. Uh, it, uh, and I've touched on a bit of it earlier this morning. But the, the importance of Fano and family to health and well-being really struck me forcibly in 19... 60-something, 1968. Uh, we were in Montreal at that point, at McGill University, and the Montreal training program in psychiatry was pretty much how they all were in those days, a large emphasis on psychoanalysis, but an equally large emphasis on psychopharmacology, which was just emerging. Chlorpromazine was the uh, talk of the, of the day, and the, and the uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors were the talk of the day. But one of the other programs that was offered there was at the Jewish General Hospital, and that was the opportunity to be involved in family psychiatry. It was a relatively new chapter in the psychiatry agenda. And in the, uh, in the family psychiatry program, the patient was the family. So although the identified patient may have came in, come in with a particular problem, the idea was to reinterpret the problem as belonging to the family. And so the, the task of the therapist was to look at the way the family interact with each other, 
what parts of that interaction had contributed to the identified patient's problem, and how might the whānau as a whole, the family as a whole, reintegrate or come together so that those problems were minimised. Usually what happened in the end, that the, the patient that had been identified in the first place was the one that had the fewest problems, and the, the major difficulties lay beyond the patient. So that, that was an introduction to family and family psychiatry. Uh, family psychiatry was strong for a while. It has not been so strong uh, of late. But when I returned to New Zealand in 1970, to the, back to the Palmerston North Hospital, uh, a new psychiatric unit opened, uh, which was based on a general hospital. There were two, two uh, of that sort open, one in Palmerston North, one in Invercargill. And uh, it had an acute psychiatric uh, number of beds, 12 beds, and a large community uh, focus. But what we managed to do was to add to the inpatient sector a family room so that uh, we would admit the family. And the family would get involved in the occupational therapy, the counselling sessions, the psychotherapy, the recreational, the occupational therapy. They would be involved in the whole range of activities as well as having time with the identified patient. Uh, some great results out of it. We ran into a bit of trouble with the uh, hospital authorities because the beds were funded according to the diagnosis on the bed. So if you're admitting a family that didn't have a diagnosis, you couldn't get funded. So we were encouraged not to admit families to the unit. Uh, we still supplemented that by home visits. But what that experience uh, tended to show was that families are important when one of their persons is very unwell, but a family therapeutic process has benefits for the whole family for a long time. Then uh, fast forward to 2009, when I became involved in a task force to look at whānau initiatives in New Zealand, and uh, went around the whole country uh, talking to various uh, whānau groups and providers of whānau services about what makes for uh, whānau health and well-being. Uh, at the end of that, we uh, presented a report to the government, and the report led to the development of a program called Whānau Order, Healthy Families. Uh, the program is still in operation. It's, uh, it's an ambitious program. First of all, its ultimate goal is whānau well-being. So it accepts that many whānau are in crisis or have problems, but that's not the end point, that's a starting point. The end point is that crises and problems get translated into fulfilling the aspirations that whānau have for the future, which is quite an ambitious undertaking. The other ambitious part about it is that it's based on the notion of intersectoral collaboration, recognising that if whānau are going to be well into the future, it's not, this is well outside the health sector alone. The health sector contributes, but it goes beyond the health sector. It includes education, it includes social development, it includes economic and employment concerns, it includes housing. And so the, on a community level, the aim of whānau order is to bring those interests together so that people, because whānau don't live their lives in sectors, they have it all wrapped in together, and to try and make that a reality for whānau. It's been easier at a community level than at a government level to get intersectoral collaboration. Uh, it starts out okay, but in the end, no minister wants to lose part of their vote to something that they don't have full control over. And uh, one of the challenges that's been identified uh, for government over the next few years is how can we get a more integrated approach to policy and legislation that looks at the realities that whānau live in, that we're not fragmented. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a fourth, uh, a f another part of uh, process is underway now and that there's a, been a series of claims to the Waitangi Tribunal, that's a tribunal that hears claims against the Crown for failing to protect Maori interests based on the Treaty of Waitangi. 
and uh, there have been uh, dozens, if not a hundred or more, separate claims to the Crown where instances of poor health can be related to government uh, negligence. And so the challenge now that uh, the, the tribunal yet to make its report, and I wouldn't like to, to say what it will be in it, well, I would like to say what should be in it, <laughs> but I don't know what will be in it, but uh, I think the point about it is that it's looking at uh, changing policy and legislation to accord much more with this notion of health and well-being. So there are, the, uh, there are the points. If I just go back to the conclusions I, I mentioned at the beginning. Oh, by the way, the, the, uh, the Whānau Order Programme, which is uh, moving well, depends pretty much on having navigators. Navigators have got two jobs. They've got to support families to make their own plans for the future. So not of all, I don't know how many of you as a family have a plan for the future, but a lot of Māori whānau didn't have it. They were just, just surviving. Uh, but the navigators say, well, now's the time to don't ignore the problems, but let's talk about where you want to be in a year's time, in two years' time, in five years' time, where will you and your children be? That's one of the jobs of the navigators. The other job of the navigators is to help whānau navigate their way through the complex systems that we operate in our health and social services, even within the health sector. Navigating between one one discipline and another discipline is problematic. And so that's the other job of the navigators, to help navigate a system, uh, through navigate through systems, so that whānau can have a much more integrated approach. So that, that's uh, really the, the, the background to these three uh, conclusions I've suggested. You've probably forgotten them, but the, uh, the, 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 first, the first one, was that if we're looking at a life course paradigm and a life course approach to health and well-being, Fano families are a logical starting point. And the, the second conclusion, which had those three parts to it, if we're looking at Fano and families and health and well-being, uh, we look not only at the current, the way they live as a Fano. By the way, many Fano now live connected by. Um, inter internet or connected online because half their people are in Australia or some other place and so that's part of the current Fano environment but also look at the historical past that may still have an impact on Fano, and that historical past may include intergenerational trauma from a range of issues and then the third part of their current experiences of course is how to address the complex environments that Fano live in. And then my last point was, and this is a, 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 a really a point for the college, is that every intervention provides an opportunity to support Fano in their resolve to be healthy and to have well-being for all their people. Kia ora.